Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a great interview for you tonight. We have Bobby West, who's the founder of an international series of cannabis uh, extract competitions called the Squash Offs. So stay tuned for a great interview with him, talking about his events all over the world. And uh, as usual, we have a great hip news segment as well. So stay tuned as we bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. Our first story tonight is from right here in America. 79% of Americans reside in a county that has at least one licensed marijuana retailer, according to data published today by the Pew Research Center. The Pew analysis estimates that nearly 15,000 dispensaries are currently operating in the United States. Several studies assessing the neighborhood impact of licensed dispensaries have reported that they are often associated with increased home values and decreases in crime. Overall, 54% of Americans now reside in a state where the adult use cannabis market is legal and 74 percent live in a jurisdiction where either marijuana is legal for either medical or adult use today for the first time since the adoption of federal marijuana pro prohibition back in 1937 more u.s citizens reside in jurisdictions where cannabis is state legal than live somewhere where it is not our next story is from seattle washington marijuana use by teens fell significantly in king county washington with a population of 2.3 million following the state's adoption of adult use legalization, according to data provided by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Investigators reported that cannabis use fell 60% among males and 42% among females from 2012, when marijuana was made legal by an initiative, to 2021. The study's authors suggested that legalization likely made it more difficult for teens to access cannabis. The study, Cannabis Use Among Students in Grades 8, 10, and 12 by Sex from King County, Washington, is available from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. From Trenton, New Jersey, state regulators have approved rules governing the operation of cannabis consumption lounges. We can't have them here in Washington or Oregon, but they have them in New Jersey. Regulators are expected to review business applications in the coming months. Under the plan, dispensary owners would be eligible to open no more than one cafe. Patrons must be 21 to enter and sales of food or alcohol are prohibited. Fewer than half of legal cannabis states permit on-site cannabis consumption facilities. New Jersey legalized the adult use cannabis market in 2021. Additional information is available from the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission. From San Diego, California, the inhalation of cannabis flowers containing THC and CBD is superior to placebos in providing migraine relief, according to data published online on the National Library of Medicine's website. Investigators affiliated with the University of California at San Diego assessed the safety and efficacy of herbal cannabis in 92 patients with persistent migraines. Patients were randomly assigned to vaporize one of four cannabis chemotypes, 6% THC, 11% CBD, 6% THC, and 11% CBD or placebo cannabis following migraine onset. Of the four chemotypes assessed, vaporized cannabis containing THC and CBD performed most effectively. No serious adverse events were reported regardless of the type of cannabis consumed. Full text of this study, vaporized cannabis versus placebo for acute migraine, a randomized controlled trial, is available online at www.medmedrxiv.org. That's med.rxiv.org. Out of New York, New York state regulators have approved long-awaited regulations authorizing adults to home cultivate personal quantities of cannabis. Members of the Cannabis Control Board signed off on the rules last week. 
The rule uh, has a 60-day public comment period now. New York is among a minority of adult use legalization states that does not currently permit adults to legally grow marijuana in their own homes, like Washington State. The new regulations will permit an adult to grow up to six plants with no more than three mature on private property and harvest up to five pounds of cannabis flower. Cultivators also have the legal option of converting their flowers to concentrates. We have a couple of stories from Berlin, Germany. German lawmakers voted late last week in favor of a plan to permit adults to legally possess personal use quantities of cannabis. The plan, which was overwhelmingly approved by members of Parliament's lower house, allows residents age 18 and older to possess up to 25 grams and home cultivate up to three plants of cannabis. It also calls for the establishment of not-for-profit cannabis clubs, which will be permitted to grow and provide cannabis for their members. Neither commercial cannabis production, retail sales, nor marijuana-related advertising is permitted under this German measure. Marijuana sales to minors remain strictly forbidden, with offenders facing penalties of up to two years imprisonment. Last year, similar legislation took effect in the European nation of Luxembourg. That followed a similar move in 2021 by lawmakers on the island of Malta. Also out of Berlin, patients with chronic pain and other conditions report that cannabis is often more effective than conventional treatments, according to data published in the journal Frontiers in Medicine. German researchers surveyed patients' experiences with cannabis products, plant cannabis, and cannabinoid treatments, such as were legalized by prescription use in Germany in 2017. However, such products are typically only authorized when patients are unresponsive to traditional therapies. Over 200 patients participated in this survey. Most respondents suffered from chronic pain, and over two-thirds of the survey's participants consumed cannabis flowers or plant-derived extracts. This study, Patient Perspectives on Prescription Cannabinoid Therapies, uh, appears uh, online in Frontiers in Medicine. As the hemp industry searches for the next big thing, an ambitious startup in Wisconsin said it expects to raise a billion dollars within three to five years to develop a factory to turn out a range of battery products based on hemp carbon using marijuana stems. The Wisconsin Battery Company in Portage, Wisconsin, hopes to have the factory finished by the end of 2024 then start production in early 2025. When completed, they'll have over 600 employees. Portage, Wisconsin municipal officials said the initiative could soften the blow brought by the shutdown of a local Energizer battery plant last year. Our last story is out of Houston, Texas. Nearly half of U.S. cancer survivors report having used cannabis, according to data published in the journal Cancers. Investigators affiliated with University of Texas Anderson Center, Cancer Center and John Hopkins University surveyed 1,886 cannabis survivors from 41 different states. Just under half, or 48%, of the respondents acknowledged having experience with cannabis. Approximately one-third of them reported using cannabis following their cancer diagnosis. Patients were most likely to report inhaling cannabis flowers or consuming oil extracts. The study authors wrote, <clears throat> many cancer survivors use cannabis as a palliative or pain reliever while undergoing cancer treatment, and this usage tends to rise following cancer diagnosis. This suggests that cannabis survivors often turn to cannabis to cope with their diagnosis or manage treatment-related symptoms, end quote. Prior surveys find that cancer patients commonly report consuming cannabis to aid with sleep and improve their ability to cope with their illness. Nonetheless, many healthcare providers acknowledge that they are unprepared to discuss cannabis therapy with cancer patients. This study, Cannabis Use Among Cancer Survivors, Use Patterns, Product Type, and Timing of Use, appears online in the journal Cancers. That's the end of our hip news segment tonight. If you are a loved one, uh, know someone who needs help uh, finding a permit for medical marijuana, then please call our office. We have a referral service. We'll be happy to direct you to physicians and healthcare providers who can help. So call us at 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. Thanks for watching. Here's our interview. Have a good night. And restore him. I'd like to welcome Bobby West back to Cannabis Common Sense. Bobby West is known by many as Uncle Stoner. And you can see there on his shirt, the logo of the Squash Off. He does these rosin press competitions. Uh, you want to tell us about how you started the Squash Off, Bobby? Yeah, well, 
basically a long time ago, around well, 2017, around 2016, I came to Matt Stan at High Times, you know, because I was always being a judge for High Times and stuff. And I, I said, hey, yeah. what's that? That was that in Amsterdam? No, no, actually, this was a this was one of the California ones they were doing. And I came up to him. I'm like, hey, let's why don't you get a house and let's put a lot of the judges in there and let me film them as we. Uh, you know, judge and everything, so people can understand what goes behind, ju- what goes in the judging and everything. And he's like, "Oh no, 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 we can't do that. We can't do that." So I'm like, "Hmm." So in uh, 2000, later on that year, we had the Hash Bash Cup in Michigan, and in my in my room, I had like 30 people there. I had an old time Roz and Tech Press, one of the first ones that came out with, you know, with all, him. and I had 30, 40 people in there looking, checking it all out, like, "Wow!" And I'm like. There's something to this. So I'm like, you know, I think I can create a competition out of this. And so I came up with the idea of creating an interactive, because I, I got tired of also a lot of these competitions around here. A lot of this, the winners were big sponsors. Not saying that they didn't deserve to win, but some of them, yes. Unfortunately, they didn't. They bought, you know, and it got to the point where people couldn't believe if the person won or not legitimately. So I wanted to create a competition that one, the consumer can sit there and listen to the judges as they judge it all the way through from putting it under a microscope is if it's being flour or if it's hash, because we do both, both, you know, flour squash offs and home out bubble hash, hash squash offs as well. But I wanted to be able to have the, the consumer or the patients sit there and be able to listen to this panel with judges and have listen to them critique it, what they and let them understand what goes into curing it, what goes into what looks what what trichomes should look like if they're you know if they're degraded, if they're gone. What does it mean if all the heads are gone or most of the heads gone? Why is that bad? You know, my judges, you know, sit there and talk all about this through this competition. And so yeah. the common person that's just starting cannabis or just newly into it, it, it this is something of value to them. I mean, they get to hear this because a lot of them didn't get, don't get to see it. They just roll it up or put it in a pipe and smoke it or hack. They don't understand, you know, what a trichome looks like or what terpenes are or anything like that. So with our competition, it it's outside, it breaks it all the way down. You bring that microscope with you. What's that? I'm sorry. You bring the microscope with you and examine it microscopically and you find yeah, it's probably you know, your proof is in the pudding, as I said, you know, because yeah. you can even see if it has mold, if it has spider mites, all that stuff. Once you put it under a microscope and project it up, we put it on a microscope, project it up to a big screen so the judges can see it and the audience can see it as the judges critique it so they can see exactly what the judges are talking about, you know. Not just wondering, oh, what does it look like, or what is it? You know, that's the other reason. Another reason I created the competition is for the competitors themselves, because a lot of times with these competitions, they hand in their entry. Three days later, they cross their fingers and hope that they uh, their name is called. If it's not called, they don't know why. And if it is called, they they well, they know, but they don't understand exactly 100% why they won 100%, what, what they did 100% correctly. And that's one thing with our competition is we allow the judge, the people that enter, we let them know their, their number. You know, we don't want to, of course, we let them know. You cannot approach the table as they're judging or anything at any time till the whole competition over, but we want you to hear because we want them to know what they're doing right so they can pat themselves on the back or what they need to do better, you know, what they're doing wrong, you know. And so that's the other reason why I created it. I wanted it to be a 100% transparent, honest um, competition. And, you know, as a lot of people say, you know, oh, it's a great competition. But my competition is only as great as the people that entered that competition and the judges I have on the panel. You know, without them, without those two elements, I, I'd be nowhere. And thank God there's people out there passionate enough to be able to sit there and grow the best, you know, grow the, the best they can cannabis, you know, or, you know, the best they can, which they'll find out if it is the best or not once they go, once they're in my competition. So, yeah, it's all about just true honesty, transparency, knowledge, education, all that stuff, you know, wrapped up into a competition form, you know, that's 
I guess that's why I created it. You know, I wanted to be transparent because I, I don't think it's fair that someone with something should be named number one. And the only reason it was named number one is because it paid the, the best best money. You know, I mean, I'm sure you you've kind of experienced that. I'm sure somewhere around your and yeah. all your years of going to competitions and all that. Because me and judges have talked before when we judge a competition and we we're like, hey, uh, yeah, yeah, this one's great. So we we named this one number one. But when it comes to announcing the awards. It's not the one that me and five other judges pick. We're like, wait a sec, that ain't right. Something's not right here. Yeah, you know, I saw that before. I mean, and so that's the reason I did this is that, you know, I wanted it 100% transparent where any person, a person watching can come up and look at the scorecards. A person watching can ask one of the judges any questions on the reason behind his scores, all that. I wanted I wanted to be 100, 100% transparent all the way through. And so, yeah. And we'd be able to do this. You know, we, uh, this is our, as a TAC wise, this is our 53rd um, squash off. We're going to be doing in Barcelona. We've actually done 54 because we've done uh, uh, CBD one as well in Ecuador, along with our flower, TAC flower one. We did a, the next day, we did a CBD one as well. So we counted that one, but I don't count it. At, I don't know. I do, but I don't. So that's why I consider Spain our 53rd one. But it's pretty good since 2017 that we've done this many of them. Yeah. I know I first met you in in Guadalajara at the Jalisco Cup, and I yeah. got to be a judge of the cup, even though uh, uh, I learned a lot in that. You know, I'm, I hadn't had a history of a big dabber, and then I watched the uh, the one last year. Was it 2022 in? Uh, uh, the Jalisco Cup and and squash off again. I guess you've got another one coming up down there uh, uh, later this year. Yeah, the Solula so, so, uh, so, so Festival and squash off. Uh, it's uh, going to be May twenty fifth and twenty sixth. They invited it back down there. A lot of great sponsors involved. I wish I had my the th the poster. I don't know if you have it or not. You know, MX MXM is involved. Uh, 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 there's a lot of great sponsors involved with this one. And like, you know, and I know, especially being old school and what we used to smoke back in the day, it's not your brick weed anymore. No, you know, no. It's they, it's right. Definitely not your brick weed anymore. That's what I, you know, it's one of my favorite sayings about Mexico because anybody smoked it from back in the day, you've got it pressed form. You had to pick through it. You had all these seeds and stems. And, oh no. These, you know, they they do it quite professionally there. They're very passionate about the cannabis plant, and so I, yeah, I love going there and squashing their flower. You know, having squash off there. This will be our I think our fourth one now in Mexico. I believe I want to say going there. So in uh, Spain, is this going to be your first one in Spain? Oh no no, this is our second one. We did one last year. Uh, uh, we did it at the Wizards Club. Um, one of the social clubs there, you know, since he as again was one of our sponsors as well. Now they're one of our hosts. They actually are having us have it at their new social lounge. Uh, they're opening a new social lounge there in Spain. And we're going to be the first event that they have there, actually. So it's kind of we're kind of the grand opening of it in Barcelona, Spain. So I'm pretty. Is that pretty be, excited. Is What's that, that? Be the museum? They have just a fantastic since he sees has a fantastic museum there. I think I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think it's right next to the museum. That's what's so cool. I, I think see. I want to say it's right next because they had the gift shop that was right next door to that big old store. Yeah. I think I'm not a hundred percent sure because they haven't exactly given us the exact location. Because as we speak, it's still under construction. They promised that it's going to be finished for our event on the 14th. That's when we're doing it at uh, four o'clock on the 14th there in Barcelona, Spain, at their new lounge. So. I'm real excited. Uh, and then they're doing a grand opening, opening VIP party on the 15th there as well. That's going to be uh, quite awesome. So there's so many different events. That's one thing about Barcelona. When I first went back there back, I mean, let's say almost 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, it was our third Spanibus that ever happened. Me and Brett Bo from Apothecary Genetics, you know, High Times Com, King Kush. We sat there and went around interviewing all these people. And it was only one big hall at that time. 
and maybe there were maybe five to six thousand people, perhaps ten showed up at that time. Now it's up to fifty or sixty thousand people. There was no, uh, there was maybe really small, small events, maybe back then around and centered around it, but nothing like there is now. I mean, there's there's so many different cups going on, so many different parties, so many. Different, I mean, a yeah. lot. You know, it, it's kind of it's yeah. great. I mean, and of course, the problem is oh, there's a lot of uh, things going on the same night. You know, like on my my night, I mean, there's there's a party going on for the member, uh, the celebration of life of Big Buddha. Milo uh, created the cheese, which love that man. I wish I could make it to that, but I have my squash shop. There's uh, there's uh, well, I think there's uh, I'm th- assholes and donuts thing I think going on that night as well with slacktivists. I think it is or Kush pop person, uh, Kush cake pop people. I mean it's. That Terp Army, our Terp Army's uh, hosting a thing with the DNA boys, which DNA, as I said, we were talking earlier, I mean, they go way back. I remember when them, them kids first came to high times with lab coats and all that, all dressed up. They were quite young. One of the first strains that they were given out free was Who's Your Daddy? You know, which was basically one female they put in a room with a shitload of metals. I just let Paul day. That's why they called Who's Your from Daddy. Michigan, are you from Indiana? I know you're from. Are you from Michigan or Indiana? Oh, actually, no. I'm originally from a town called Grass Valley, California. Yeah, okay. I know where that's at. Elevation 4 to 20. So I've always joked about it. Two smoke weed, you know, elevation uh, yeah, 2 four twenty. But I'm from that town, Grass Valley. I was born there. Uh, from there, I went, moved there over to New Mexico. You know, elementary or middle school and high school, and then right out of high school, May twenty eighth, I graduated. June third, I was in boot camp for the Navy. Yeah. Did Navy a lot of? You know, I did a total of close to fifteen years military, Navy, Army, active Navy, uh, Army, National Guard, combat medic. Worked at VA hospitals, all that stuff. I got my hundred percent. Once I got my hundred percent, that's when I started traveling the world. And started to learn more about cannabis because they pushed all kinds of chemicals down me trying to control my PTSD and everything else. And uh, it didn't work until I sparked up a, a joint and I'm like, whoa, there's something to this. And so I chose that as my medication. And that's when I first went to Mexico, learned about their cannabis and stuff, grew my hair a little bit long. And then from there to Jamaica, that's where I started my, when I had dreadlocks, started them at Bob Marley's house. Back in the day, they sent me down as I'm looking at that doorstep, threw little birds upon my doorstep. Where was that? What you? Oh, that was, I think, 2000 or 2001, I think. I think it was two, I think it was 2001, maybe. Okay. Yeah, 2001. Yeah, 2001 is, yeah, of course, he was passed on since then, but his yeah. cousins and all that still ran Sugar Hill, Nine Mile. And I, uh, yeah, I and, just saw that movie this weekend, that new One Love movie. It's pretty good. I hear it is. I hear it is really good. I know one of the people that are in it, King, King Shai or some they, he's, uh, they sent me his number because he's really good friends with the, the Cincy crew and all that. And so we're doing a squash off and everything in Jamaica coming up in April. So they wanted me to reach out to him, see if he'd come down and be a judge and all that and everything. And I think he's in the movie. I I know I'm, I I can't pronounce his name correctly. If my wife was here, she'd be able to <laughs> say his name correctly. Uh, but he's a musician, all that. But he's I think he was in the uh, Bob Moore movie that just came out. So I hear it was I hear it's quite well. I'm gonna I'll be watching it before I take off to Jamaica after I get back from Spain. I mean, so busy. Because after Spain, we get back on the 19th. And then the first weekend of April, we got Mich- the Ann Arbor Hash Bash and Hash Bash Cup, you know. So we'll be doing a squash off at the Hash Bash Cup, of course. You know, right. that's the beginning of April. And then and then on the 16th of April, I take off over to Jamaica. We'll be doing the squash off there at 419, 420. Come back home for a week or two. Then we take off to Mexico. Uh, that's in May. Come back. And then I think I'm only home like a week or two again. Then we take off to Ecuador, which is awesome. Ecuador, this will be our second edition doing a squash up. But we're also partnered up with the Center of the World Cup. They're doing a Center of the World Cup and squash up there. So they're inviting all the countries around them, South America and all that, to participate in this uh, big old cup and squash up there in Ecuador, which uh, I was quite impressed with cannabis. Uh, you know, we... 
We just came from Denmark, which they had really nice entries in Denmark, but not as nice, not as nice as what we saw in Ecuador. I mean, oh my God, I was, it, it, I was very, very impressed with the cannabis in Ecuador, you know. And I, that's what's so great now that the, the stereotype is down and the laws are changing. People are one that I went to judge, La Perla Cup in Ecuador. And oh, yeah. And gave us these nifty cups with our, our logo on it and everything. But And we went out and saw the whales, too. We got to watch just tons of uh, uh, humpback whales jumping off the coast of Ecuador there. Oh, they gave awesome. the what, for the so, so you were in the uh, San, what Got part of Ecuador did you go to? Ayaquil, the the biggest Ayaquil. city on the coast. Not yeah, a, I think this one group invited us to come down there and spend like a few days after we got done doing our squash off. We just didn't have time. We were in Quito, uh, Quito in the mountains. Yeah, is where we are, which I love. That's where we're having the squash off and big old center of the World Cup again in August, as I said. And I said, it, it's great because South America and all that, they've been growing cannabis before we even thought about it. Oh, yeah. Same with Jamaica. Same with Jamaica. I mean, Jamaica had strains that had been brought in for for so long. A lot of people don't realize that uh, you know, Jamaica was a huge port. That It had parts of Jamaica had electricity before New York even had it. So you had people coming all over from China, Himalayas, you name it, Afghanistan, Africa, bringing all these different genetics. Have been on this island in Jamaica for all these years. Where it's, I mean, there's some beautiful strains there. A lot of strains have been created because of that, uh, because of Jamaica and stuff. You know, I myself, my wife, we created a few different strains that we, you know, we took some of Crockett stuff, some of DNA stuff, some of Sensi stuff, a few other of my favorite, uh, uh, you know, seed companies and strains. We took them. And we phenol hunted. I know a lot of different Rastafarians there in Jamaica, and they let us phenol hunt, go in the garden, and look at strains they've been growing for centuries. Same strain they've been growing for centuries. Let let me and my wife phenol hunt and pick out which ones we wanted to work with to, to create our strains with. So I'm, I feel pretty blessed that we were able to do that and everything. And uh -huh. So I, oh, I'm yeah. trying to do more than just a shop, you know, because I've been I've been I. I've been around cannabis and the cups in Amsterdam, it said since 2001 is, you know, when I first went over to Amsterdam and got the name Uncle Stoner. And so I, you know, and I've, you know, and I've seen the progress of how this plant and this, in this industry has gone where to, it wasn't an industry to, it was a legacy and black market to where it was only California. So now it's almost, I mean, I don't know how many different States we have now, like 24, 25, maybe, I don't know how many, but to where now the government is taxing it so much. Like California, I mean, cannabis is taxed more than gasoline, alcohol. I mean, it's gone to a point where it's ridiculous. And I think what they're doing is they're trying to get it pushed everybody out, not just the big companies now, the big money out, people have money, even them, but where it's controlled by the pharmacy and the government. And only certain strains and certain strength, strengths are you allowed to use and have, which I hope it doesn't go that way. I mean, I hope it doesn't get it where we lose control of what the true projection of this plant and how we've seen it, how Dennis Brown saw where it should go, how Eddie Lepp wanted to see it, where it went. So many others, pioneers that have passed away. I mean, they're happy to a point now it is legal and to a certain point, but now we're almost losing control of it because our government wants to grab it, seize it, and, 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 and yeah. Yeah, and, you know, so many. Of, speaking of activists who passed away just this morning as we're recording this, a uh, good friend of both of ours, Rory Gould of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and the founder of uh, uh, Ann Arbor's uh, uh, Arborside Dispensary. He uh, he passed away much too young, much too young. Way I, too young. Such a great guy. I mean, God, such a great guy. I mean, I knew him. I think I'm, I don't know, it was either 2010, 2011, I met him. And then he introduced me to my wife, actually, in California at a High Times Cup in 2015. He he somehow knew her, and and I didn't at that time. And he's like, "Young here, I want you to meet you to Deb." And boom. <laughs> so because of him, you know, I'm with my wife today. Yeah. And we, we did we spent a lot of time together before me and Deb got together. We did a lot of traveling together, and so he 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 was a good guy, really you know, really good guy. Uh, 
a lot of people out there loved and respected him. You know, he's there's a lot of people, you know, it should be cheap face, but there's tons of people who's put pictures out there with him at various stages of, of life and all that. And, he and was he, on the show during our Hipstock Festival back in 2011. I know because I went and looked up the pictures again. So he oh, was wow. on way back then. But uh, yeah, it's a, a shame. They, yeah. You know, as we get older, more and more people keep yeah. going. Yeah, as we get older, our mortality starts sinking in that we're, we're not young anymore. And that's why we have to embrace our friends and they have to hang, make sure they know that we truly care about them and stuff. You know, I'm glad we, Roy and I were communicating. I mean, it was December when the last time I sent, you know, we sent something to each other because he wanted to be, be a judge again of squash off because he knew we were bringing it back to Michigan. Yeah. He was going. He was going to come back out here to Oregon for the first time and allow. Uh, recently, too, when we talked a couple months back. But uh, anyway, so tell me. Let's go on about. You went to Amsterdam. Did you, you lived in Amsterdam for some time, right? Well, off and on. I had a flat there uh, for a while. Yes, for a long, a long while. I had a flat there. Yeah, I'd go three to four months at a time, come back home, and then go off to all other places. But yes, basically. I pretty much lived there, and that's why I know a lot, know a lot of the people there, and a lot of the coffee shop owners and stuff. And it's kind of like a second home to me. I'm I'm blessed to be able to consider that a second home. I'm excited because my wife and I actually will be over there on the morning of the seventh. You know, we'll be seeing a lot of people that you know, although we saw them last year, but they're all our friends because you know we've known them for a lot it's of years. Amazing how many different events are going on around the the span of us in in Barcelona. You know, I I've seen. Uh, just a ton of different things, you know. I is isn't uh, Mila? Does she she's got a dab of do going on too, right? We Tell her me well. about how, you, how you're working with Mila. Well, I, I mean, she's been actually she's been one of our judges, uh, honestly, probably the most out of everybody because she was at the very first squash off we ever did, 2017 at Chalice at the Rosin Tech booth. She was one of the judges there. And she pretty much any time I've done one in the U.S., you know, in Boston, California, anywhere that she's at and I'm at and we're doing one, she's been a judge. So, I mean, I don't know how many times she probably judges probably maybe 15 to 20 times at least the squash shop at least, you know. And I mean, this time will probably be the 22nd or 23rd time. Um, she's a great woman. Anytime that she does a, a dab do which I don't know how many she's done of these. I mean, if I've done 50 something, 50 or 53 of these squash shots, I can imagine how many dab a she's done. Because before she just did them in Amsterdam and there, and then she started branching out, tried doing Spain, then started branching out more and more. Now, now she travels all over the world, South America, you know, US, everywhere doing these squash shots. I mean, she's a She's an amazing, passionate woman. I, I was blessed to meet her over 21 years ago. I learned a lot from her about making hash and everything. And yeah, I'm I'm blessed to, to still know her today and, and the, that she uh, is going to be able to be a judge again of, of our squash off. You know? Right. She and I got to go to Machu Picchu back in 2022 mm. as well. And, uh, but it's her her uh, machines the pollinator machines that uh, really she started making these hash making devices uh kind of with silk screens and they'd spin the the material around and the trichomes would fall through and and that's how we they make hash uh or it's one of the ways i i've used just a regular silk screen in the past as well but sometimes some of her and machines I, I are that. show everybody how easy it is to do that. You know, you know, she got, you know, she learned some of the methods, you know, she knew some, but she also learned from Reinhold. Reinhold taught her some stuff about bubble hash and making and stuff. And then she took that knowledge and created the machine with the bags. And with that knowledge, bubble man took, he took that knowledge from that he learned from Mila and then created the bubble bags. So it was like, you know, it was a legacy kind of passed on to uh, three different people from Brian Holt, to Mila, from Mila to, to uh, Bubble Man, BC Bubble Man and all that. But uh, yeah, I love the, yeah, her machine is still there, still being sold around the world. You know, it's, it's an easy machine to use. You just put it in there, you know, put, put it in there, put the water in, put the ice in, turn it on. 
you know, because you want to make sure you gently, gently, you know, back in the day, a lot of us didn't know that we beat the hell out. I mean, we beat the hell out of that ice and that water. No, you just want to just nicely. And we try and get it as cold as possible. No, there's a sweet spot. There's that sweet spot that you want to get it at where it's not too cold, not too hot. And you want to stir it just right. You don't want to over agitate it. You know, you can. I mean, you're still going to get some decent quality, but the quality would be way better if you do it with a wooden spoon or with her, her uh, it said the pollinator, one of her machines. Yeah, she's also got the dry sift machine. I think yeah. that's where she started before the bubble hash yeah. water ones, the, the drive sift machines. But uh, um, so tell me more about the yeah, I don't know if anybody's read the book, how I, how I became the hash queen, you know. Yeah, I've got a copy of it right over here. I'm actually in that book. I don't know if you noticed yeah. that. I, okay. I personally, I think I'm the reason, I could be wrong, but I think I'm the reason she wrote that book. Because I used to tell her for years, because she used to tell me all kinds of her stories, uh, you know, what she used to do back in the day to all this. And I'm like, Mila, you're a pioneer of this. And there's not too many women that are pioneers in this industry. You're, you know, you're, you need to tell your story. You know, you're considered the ash queen. You need to tell your story about this. And she's like, oh, I don't think anybody wants to hear it. I'm like, no, they do. Trust me. Now the blue, I get email from her saying, "Hey, I need you to sign this release form." I didn't ask why. Next thing I know, you know, I get a copy of her book. Of course, I'm in there. I'm in the in her book. It's me, her, and Brandon from Die and Breathe Third Generation. You know, and everything. Which he started out on Eddie Lips Farm back in the day. You know, he and everything. So it's a big book. It's really thick. Yeah, it, it is. It is a really thick book. I have not read it all. I'll be honest with you. It is a very, because I've known her for 20 years. So, all, I mean, I, I get to spend personally quality time with her. You know, and I have all over the world. And so, you know, I, I anything, any questions I want to know about her life or this or that, I talk to her directly, you know. So, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. But for those that don't have that option, this is a great book to be able to, uh, to understand you know, her life and ash and everything, you know. Yeah, she spent a lot of time in Nepal and in India trekking around the Himalayas there before she became the hash queen. But uh, so tell me about your work with Cincy Seeds. Haven't you uh, done some well, stuff with Ben Drockers? Well, they're, you know, yeah, Ben and I, well, we're, they're one of our main sponsors for Squash Off and everything. And, uh, so we've been doing uh, some great things with with them. Uh, other, I mean, uh, as far as our seeds and stuff, uh, we are doing some uh, testing with some other companies, which I cannot say, you know, to NDAs and whatnot. But I can't say with Ben Dronker and all them guys, they are uh, they are uh, one of our main sponsors for this year and everything. And I've known Ben for over. 20 years you know i've grown a lot of their strains from back in the day to now i took a lot of our actually our um, our strains that we made in uh, jamaica and we took uh, from their hash plant to the jack Herrera, to the skunk number one to the hindu kush to uh i mean the early girl to, but list goes on we took and we crossed that with some of our strains one of the main strains that i crossed with a lot of those is our high school reunion it's one of you know all the old and it's like four different strains of some of the old school stuff that you used to smoke back in the day, you know. So so and we have a few companies doing some tests testing on that and everything. And so far they're really happy with with that. Well, the squash off has been just a, a rosin press event, but now you're you're also doing bubble hash. Why don't you explain to our well, audience that no, don't it, know how a rosin press works? Well, first of all, it wasn't always, no, we actually, from the beginning, yes, the very first one we did was flour, but I think it was either the second or third one, we did it where we did flour entry and bubble hash entry. We just had separate awards. We did it in Michigan a few times, we, uh, in a few other states, uh, and then we just got to have a very, very successful one in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we did flour entry in the morning time. Uh, you know, Judge Jack squashed all that. And then later on the evening, we did a full melt bubble hash where they fast froze the plant. They they made it into bubble hash. They cured it. They brought it into into uh, to us in little ice chests and stuff. We put it right in the refrigerator and 
from that, you know. But you ask what is pressing or what is yeah, explain that to our audience how that works. Well, pressing is basically you're using if for flour, well, pressing is you're using heat and pressure to crunch and uh, apply pressure and heat to the trichomes of the plant and the lipids, the fat and the lipids and stuff. What that does, it opens them up and it squashes them to a dispersed and all that rosin, or they call it rosin, which is the uh, uh, the bulbous or which is the term, or the trichome, that's just the juice in there. All that juice and everything comes out of that plant with the terpenes, the terpenes, which is the different flavors, what you taste or what you smell. All that comes out into a, which they call a rosin form. It just squirts out. So you have, you know, uh, through a bat. So you have to load it up into a rosin bag, which we use Gutenberg dank pressing bags, the ones we use for our competition. You load that up and then you put it in underneath into a, what we use is a rosin tech press. Um, we, and then we squash it down. First, you lower it down. You let it sit for about 19 to 20 seconds. Let that heat. Start working it in, getting the uh, lipids and the trichomes loosened up, and then you slowly start adding pressure to it. Slow, start adding pressure to it. You squash it, and you do that for around from start to finish about three minutes as a, for flour. Around three minutes from start to finish usually is what it takes from the flour form all the way to it squirting out into rosin. Uh, with hash, it can uh, you can go a little bit some a little bit lower or sometimes a little bit longer. But I've learned usually with hash, I go low and slow, especially with high end hash. Yeah. You know. Uh huh. I see. Okay. What is the temperature that the uh, rod? Is temperature be okay. For flour, we used to do around a one one ninety to one ninety five in our competition. For hash, we usually I I usually like it around one sixty to one uh, one sixty to one seventy for. For full melt bubble hash, I have seen some people from production. They actual uh, for bubble hash, they'll actually go 190, but it still works. Um, you with 160, you get get more terpene profiles and stuff. Let yes of a yield. The higher up you go, uh, temperature wise, usually the more yield it's going to come out. But also the color is going to change a little bit sometimes too when the heat goes up. Same thing with the flour and stuff. If you pull it early. The rosin is usually going to look uh, more yellow, more golden color. If you let the flower go later, later on and cure right, it's going to look darker. Now, the benefit of sometimes doing that, the terpenes mature longer. And the terpene profile is more robust when you let it go longer. Um, but nowadays, people like to pull it, pull it, you know, where it's that beautiful gold color. They still get some really good terpenes in there because usually the plant that the pollen the terpenes are amazing. But if they sometimes but if they let it go a little bit longer, really get a great profile. But unfortunately, people are worried about the color. They think if it if it's a dark color or a little bit darker to it, if it's not you know looking like like you know like that or even lighter, you know, it's kind of looking a little dark because it's a bunch in there. But if it's not looking lighter than that, you know, oh, oh, well, you know, I was pulled too late, or this and that. I, I personally, you know, the uh, you get a full spectrum more. You get more of a spectrum if you let the plant go longer. You know, with our competition, we, I, I, you know, I let my judges make their own decision if they like. Some of my judges love it when they see the trichome all the way bent over with that burgundy spot in the middle of there, the last burgundy dot and everything, a little milky to it. Some of my judges like that. Some of them like it where, yeah, it's bent over, but it's just clear and everything. You know? So it depends on, on who you are. And that's that's why I try and get anywhere from eight to ten judges. So an average of what they say and what they score comes out. And that's you know, because different people are just like different consumers have different flavor and different tastes. Same thing with my judges. So I try and balance it out so I it you know it evens out perfectly for our competition. I know so, I went I went around. <laughs> no, that's good. So when you press, how much flour do you usually press, and how much rosin results from that? And I know it varies. It varies. Uh, I mean, we uh, for our competition, uh, 
we squash uh, around seven grams of flour, of flour. We usually get for a seven, we can get up, you know, usually uh, around three grams. Usually a good squash, three to 3.5 gram is a really good yield. Because that's one thing we uh, we started out for a while at one of, I think it was our third or fourth competition. We squashed only five grams, but the yield was like huge. And one of the uh, judges was like, wow, how many did you squash? And I told him only five. He's like, no way. This thing is humongous. So we started doing, start, we stopped it now, but we started doing the highest yield. Because we learned, we learned some strains just produce so much more. Rosin, rosin, so much more. Of course, that's what the uh, washers and the, and the rosin makers are looking for. Them plants and strains that really produce, really wash well or squash well. And right. uh, yeah, we, um, so usually we get, you know, it, with hash, you'll get, you, you should at least get a half return. So if you're a squash in five grams, you should get 2.5. If you, you know, you're doing the audience, I said, if you're going seven, you should definitely get 3.5 to, you know, four grams back of, of good high-end rosin. You know, rosin usually always get more of a return because it's already sifted through. There's no there's no plant matter or anything for the, you know, they have to get filtered out or for that rod for that the rosin to go through when you squash it. It just has broom, natural squat broom, it comes out. Um I was hoping in time we did for our, we did said we did a a, a bubble hash squash shop in Albuquerque. I wish I had some of the videos on that, and because looking at it up at that on, on the on the TV screen when we put it under the microscope, the rosin. I mean, a lot of it just looked like snow. It was so beautiful. I mean, you can just beautiful, this beautiful snow or diamonds. That's how well these people did, you know. And uh, rich, yeah, and it came through on when we squashed it. Once we once we put it on the press and everything, especially the less material that had in it. The cleaner the, 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 the rosin was, the nicer, the cleaner, and the more the yield we got. We did have one or two that did have some particles in it and stuff, but the yield wasn't as good because you had a little bit more resistance with the uh, material. You mentioned diamonds. Do you want to explain to our audience what the different forms of the rosin and the diamonds are? I mean, uh, that's a <laughs> Well, one thing we've learned is when you squash, especially with flour uh, uh, and some and some other strains of hash and stuff, the form, when you squash it, the rosin comes out differently. Sometimes you'll get it, it'll come out battery, more battery. So there seems like there are more lipids, more fat in there to where it's more sugary. Where uh, the sugar, there's more TACA, more of, the, more of the TAC came out, the TAC crystallized, and so it gets sugary and stuff. And basically diamonds is all TACA. Which, if you know what you're doing, you can take from flower form, squash it down to rosin, reload that rosin up into another bag, squash that down, reload it up into another bag, a mesh bag. You can keep on doing that where you get this basically white powder THC diamond powder from raw, straight from flower form all the way down to just by you kept on keep on pressing it, pressing it, changing it into a different bag. I mean nice. that. As far as uh, diamond chase, see diamond BHO wise, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I know that, you know. That's explosive. Yeah, it's explosive. So I like to do it naturally, just heat and pressure, you know. I, I solve less. You just, just heat pressure. That's all it takes to make that beautiful rosin, you know. You so need anything else. You've got the the Barcelona squash off coming up uh and then you're going to go to the hash bash you've got another one coming up in jamaica and mexico do you have and ecuador do you have any others on the plan right now uh yes and i don't know why i cannot remember them but yes we do we have a um when germany's reached out to me because germany you know they just came legal so we're trying to figure out one in germany uh we got we'll have another one in december in new mexico in Albuquerque, beginning of December, we'll do a same thing we did last time, a flower entry one, and then a bubble hash entry one in the evening time. Um, I'm trying to look and trying to figure out Oklahoma, any states that, that are legal, that want us to come, I'll come there. Yeah, because it takes us to Oregon and Washington, of course. 
Yeah, I love to do them in states. I have not done those yet. We have to be careful because some states, like we used to do them in California, but now they consider squashing. Although it's just heat and pressure, they consider that processing. And you need a M1 processing license. And your M1 processing license is only tied to the facility that you're at. You need one that you can, is mobile. I mean, they, as I said, California made it so hard for us even to go there. Same thing with Colorado. Colorado's a little hard to do one there as as well because of their their laws and such. So we have to be careful what the laws are and what they dictate as far as press, you know, squashing, if they consider that manufacturing or if they consider it just organically made supplements, which that's what I think it is. Because even with the, you know, with people making it into bubble hash, you know, taking the plant, flash freezing it, making it in bubble hash and then squashing it, that's still all the way natural all the way through. So, yeah, I'd love to do Oregon. And so I just need a location and, and everything to do it at. You see, we get invites and stuff now. And okay. set up trying to schedule places like I used to. I used to do 12 a year. I used to look for where to go. Now, usually we get people reaching out to us. Hey, can you come here? Hey, can you come here? Because one of the things people are learning or I've learned and, is that everybody thinks of the Michael Jordan of wheat, especially in a new, new, new market or everything. Oh, I do the best. I do the best. I do the best. Well, with our competition, that gives you a chance to prove it. I mean, as I said, we put everything under a microscope. We got judges that have pedigrees that go way back. You know, you know, Mila, Frenchie, God rest his soul, we've had him. Uh, Soma, you know, Rory Gould, who passed away, he's been a judge. Uh, Danny Danko, Sean Black, Gidea, um, James Loud. James Loud with Loud Seeds, Loud Podcasts, Loud Genetics. He's been a judge. He was a judge last year in Spain. He's a judge this year as well. Surge Cannabis, uh, he's a judge. So we try and get you know, really high-end judges. And what I also try and do is get judges in that area, wherever state or country we go to or area or city, I try and get judges that people look up to, peer, that people say yes. They that person knows his shit. So when they score them, they're not they, you know, they're not gonna sit there and say, oh, that, that's BS. That you know, they they honor their judgment and stuff. So I always try to get the best judges I can, you know. And it's worked out pretty good for us. I mean, as I said, I've had Mila, Frenchie, Soma, uh, Giddy up, uh, and a few other people all on the same panel at the same time. Over over a hundred years of cannabis experience on one panel. You know, it's 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 nice. I feel blessed, you know, that that I was able to create this competition and that we've been able to do so many of them and it's still going strong. I mean, we still get invites uh, to there, you know, Columbia. They want us to bring it over to Columbia eventually because Columbia. They're going pretty strong in the cannabis industry. Thailand, as long as they don't change their laws, we're open to bring it over to Thailand. Um, as I said, Germany, the uh, Leonard, Lenny, Leonard, uh, the one who puts on the hand cam there in Germany, big, uh, big cannabis thing. He's already reached out to me like, okay, now you can come over and squash. Let's start organizing it. You know, as each state, each country opens up, I would love to I said, bring this anywhere, any place that will have us. I hope hope they'll you know invite us. That's all it takes. Does invite us, help us get out there because this does cost, you know, this does cost us money. I mean, I do have sponsors and stuff, but even them, it still costs money for the awards, for the travel, all that, for the accommodations. And so we do, you know, we do look forward to uh, trying to get good sponsors, and we do have to charge for our for entry fees. But our entry fees is nothing like a lot of these competitions that are going on now or used to go on you know the most we charge at most is you know 250 if that and uh, uh, we used to now it's like some places we go on the economy what that per what the economy is in that country or that state what people can afford because it's not about making the money it's about the competition the knowledge and bringing that knowledge to people and everything and as i said we're only as good as the, the people we have compete in our competition and the judges I get on the panel, you know. So is there anything else you'd like to to touch on here, Bobby? Anything we haven't? Sure. As soon as I get off the phone, uh, off with you, I'm like, son of a gun. I knew I shouldn't have mentioned that. <laughs> uh, 
no, just, uh, you know, our dude uh, looked uh, for the name Tower Genetics. You'll start hearing that name out there pretty soon. That's the what we're doing our genetics under. Because when my wife and I came together, which I mentioned, Rory, Rory Gould introduced us, God rest his soul. Um, we moved together in Colorado off of Tower Street. And that's where I bought my genetics that I already had from all my travels. And she had some genetics as well. And that's where we first started doing it, doing our genetics. Got a sweet Jesus and Mr. Durple that we, uh, it was actually grown in Alaska. It was top shelf uh, for a while uh, with this one company there. So we started with that. And uh, that's why we call it child genetics. But yeah, just uh, stay tuned because a lot of our genetics are based out of old school lineage. A lot of lineage of old school strains. You know, there's some little bit of new stuff, but most of it has a lot of the old school stuff you know, bred into uh, other old school lineage to make new stuff. And that's what we did. So, you know, look forward to that, I guess. So in terms of the upcoming uh, schedule, is there anything in particular that you uh, want to touch on in Barcelona, Jamaica? Ann Arbor. Yeah, if you if you want to come to Jamaica, they have a package going on right now, at Coral Cove. I forgot the price, but uh, it includes you know a joint every morning and all that. Getting into the event, we're doing a uh, orange uh, orange hill ganja cup and music festival at Squash Off. It's going to be a four nineteen to four twenty at a place called Blue Hill in Orange Orange Hill. So any of you guys that want to come to Jamaica and celebrate four twenty in Jamaica, please. Please come out. I'll reach out to Coral Cove. I'll let them know that you heard about the package from Uncle Stoner, and I'll make they'll they'll give you a good deal. Plus, there's gonna be some other packages that they're working out with some of the other hotels. But that's one of the events. That, yeah, I'd love to have see people come. And of course, the center of the World Cup that we're doing in Ecuador. I think that's gonna be a big, big event right there. The uh, people that are organizing it have been really working hard, doing their due diligence to make sure this is gonna be a good, good event. They've already invited some great judges from around the world and stuff to come. So, you know, look forward to that one and keep your eye out on hearing more stuff about that event coming coming up excuse me well great well i appreciate having you back on the show again to talk about all the upcoming events and history and everything if somebody wants to reach out to you what's the best way to do it i know your instagram is very popular right yeah well i especially if they do the right one uncle stoner one word that's the correct one i had to do a back what one a while back because that one got shut down for some reason for a little bit which is uncle stoner dot tm on a I don't use that, but so Uncle Stoner on IG, Uncle Stoner on Facebook, USA Squash Off on IG, USA Squash Off on Facebook, and then Uncle Stoner on uh, YouTube is uh, some of the best ways to get a hold of me. Okay. Well, thanks. We've had Bobby West on with uh, the, the International Squash Offs and uh, also known as Uncle Stoner. Thanks for coming back on, Uncle Stoner, and I look forward to seeing you out there on the uh, Rosin Press uh, uh, trail somewhere. Well, thank you for having me on the show again. Always a pleasure talking to you and everything, Paul. You've done a lot. You've done a lot for this community and cannabis and everything. I thank you. You know, so very welcome. Take care. Thanks.